this place, in 939, was buried the first king of all England. In his day, a Norseman called him the greatest man in the European world. To a Frenchman, he was the most famous king of modern times. An Irishman thought him the summit of the honor of the Western world. From Iceland, from Germany and Wales, poets sang of his deeds. Renowned through the whole globe, whom God set over the English as king, plainly so that mighty in war, he might conquer other fierce kings and crush their proud necks. And yet, who knows of Athelstan to death? This is Malmesbury in Wiltshire, one of the most famous centres of civilization in early Britain. Although its Norman church is now a fragment, its library has been destroyed, and the last of its treasures were sold off to the United States before the Second World War. But it still can show the visitor this tomb of its most famous benefactor, King Athelstan, although it's unlikely that he actually lies underneath this later monument. Athelstan was the grandson of Alfred the Great. He ruled for only 14 years during the 10th century. But in that time, he unified England and effectively brought it out of the Dark Ages to a position of unparalleled power and prestige. He was a sort of English Charlemagne, a man with all the glamour and appeal of an American president. I suppose he's unknown to most of us today, but he is still a local hero here in Malmesbury. And quite right too, for he was the founder of the first British Empire. When the 10th century dawned, the political and racial landscape of Britain, which we know today, had not been settled. The Viking invasions had swept away the old order. Now many different peoples, Celts, Anglo-Saxons and Vikings, stood poised to contest for supremacy. It was to be the English who would triumph, they who would form the first empire of Britain. They were bolstered by ideologies developed in Carolingian Europe, imperial ideologies. This painting of Athelstan, our first royal portrait, shows him like a continental emperor, a crowned and anointed warrior of God. In fact, the king was illegitimate and seen by some merely as a caretaker king. So the coronation order devised for him in 925 was created to boost his shaky claim. It would be used again in 1953 by his distant kinswoman, Elizabeth II. When he came to the throne, Athelstan ruled an uneasy alliance of the traditional enemies, Wessex and Mercia, with their joint military occupation of the Danelaw to the east, the area settled by Danes in the time of Alfred the Great. Over the Humber, Northumbria was an independent Viking kingdom. Beyond, to the west, and north, most of the Celtic kingdoms were inveterately hostile to the West Saxon king. 927, Aurora Borealis, fiery lights in the northern sky, omens of war. Athelstan's backers saw in him a focus for their warlike aspirations, for theirs was a militarist society, and they wanted to unite the English under his rule. In the next two years, the 30-year-old king swept Britain in a blitzkrieg. Heavily armed Danes, equipped with the glittering technology of the English military elite, spearheaded the attack. Hammered blades, inlaid with gold and silver, endowed with magic, signifiers of both wealth and terror. military machine, built up under Alfred the Great, was first deployed against Northumbria.
York, capital of Anglo-Danish Northumbria, mercantile center of the Dark Age North. Here, there had always been hatred and mistrust of the southern kings, but the Roman walls that still encircled the city were no defense against Athelstan's army. He sacked the Danish quarter and expelled the ruling family who fled west to their kinsmen in Dublin. For the first time in English history, York was under southern rule. That summer, Athelstan's army rode north from York through the inhospitable wilds of Northumbria. Their goal was the great fortress of Bambra. Here, an English dynasty had ruled for generations, uninterrupted by the Vikings. They swiftly surrendered and became Athelstan's vassals. Farther north still, a dynasty of powerful Celtic kings ruled over Scotland, Strathclyde and the Lake District. Here, where the two waters meet at Earmont Bridge, on the 12th of July, 927, they submitted to the overwhelming might of Athelstan. In a great ceremony, they agreed to accept him as their overlord, to pay him tribute, and to suppress idolatry among the Viking settlers in the northwest. From now on, the Earmont and Ullswater would be the frontier of a new England. Unstoppable now, Athelstan turned his army south and attacked the Welsh. Here, at Hereford, their five kings submitted to him. In a sort of door bar, they promised to pay him a vast tribute in gold, silver, thousands of head of cattle, and to give royal gifts to the self-styled emperor. Athelstan now turned his attention to the Celts of the southwest and crushed the resistance of the Cornish, who still had their own kings. Here, at Exeter, he cleaned up the British ghettos and founded a new church to publicize his triumph. Superseded by the later Norman cathedral, the footings of Athelstan's church have been discovered recently and the site is marked by this iron cross. From now on, Exeter would be the bastion of English settler rule in the southwest. The ancient world of the Celts had been upturned. By 928, less than three years after his coronation, Athelstan was the undisputed ruler of Britain, king of what was now coming to be called England, overlord of all the kings round about, who were bound to him by bonds of tribute. He was emperor of the whole world of Britannia, and the title was proudly blazoned on his coins to prove it. This imperialism stuck in the throats of the Celts. As they bowed to him and gave him their gifts, they thought him arrogant and rapacious, a Shah of Shahs. But although Athelstan subjugated the Celtic peoples, he was also intrigued by the antiquity of their culture. Unlikely as it may seem, the conqueror of the Celts turned out to be obsessively generous to their churches. One of the holy sites he visited was here at Stoke St. Necton on the North Devon coast. Susan Pierce has made a special study of the church in the southwest. Susan, what kind of church did Athelstan inherit in the, in the southwest? Well, there were, in his day, there were a whole series of English minsters, and quite a lot of them descended directly from British monasteries, so that by the time Athelstan was here, they were already some 400 years old. And Stoke St. Nexon is almost certainly one. There are others at St. Q, um, Congressbury, Dastonbury, and so on. So they were really ancient places to him? Oh, they were. I think this was one of the fascinations. They all of them looked back to a British saint, like Nexon, uh, as their founder. And the saint was buried on the spot. His relics lay in the church. And I think Athelstan was terribly impressed by the antiquity of this. I think it was mysterious, and it was very old, and it was very holy. And it was the sort of thing that a man of the 10th century found very, um, well, very impressive, very awesome. And Athelstan was very much a man of his time, 
and I think this for him had a tremendous emotional hold. It's curious, isn't it, when he was fighting the British world on the one hand, that he was fascinated by it on the other? Absolutely. I think perhaps the fact that he took a hospitable attitude to the traditions of the British church and was prepared to confirm their lands or grant them lands or at any rate to be very gracious to them must have been one of the reasons that helped a great deal. Did the English conquest make any real difference to, to life in the, in the South West, do you think? I don't think anything very much makes a great deal of difference to life in the South West. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, English speaking gradually became more common and Cornish speaking became less common. You know, uh, but this, I think, is the story, really. No great dramatic changes. But uh, is his reign a watershed in the history of this well, it's a watershed of the world? In the, well, it's a watershed in this sense that, politically, Cornwall is now, really, a part of Wessex. Um, it may have maintained some sort of political identity. There are traditions of local Cornish kings, which seem to come to an end round about Athelstan's time. Mm. So uh, perhaps one could say that, that it, it, Cornwall is now really essentially a part of, of Wessex and of England. Wales, however, was never to be a part of England. This is the River Wye, which Athelstan set as the frontier between the two. In this border zone, the king was solicitous of Welsh feeling, enacting conciliatory local law. But here too, a string of forts controlled the tradeways into England. The lines were drawn. The question now was, how long would the Celts accept this new fall of Britain? Meanwhile, inside England, the administration had to be shaped to create a unitary rule. And in Athelstan's time, the shires were formed in Mercia, which lasted until the so-called reform of 1974. In the eastern Midlands, the shires were formed around the five boroughs, which had been Danish army bases in the previous generation. One of them was Stamford. One of the most beautiful of English towns, Stamford would now be a rival to Oxford and Cambridge if renegade Oxford scholars had set up their planned university here in the 14th century. In the prosperous 10th century, Stamford was head of its own autonomous region. It has now lost its shire, but here recently the site of the Danish town has been located and over the river the street plan of the English borough with its individual plots is perfectly preserved. Walking over the Welland Bridge, which stood on this spot in Athelstan's time, and you'd be walking from Danish Stamford into English Stamford, because there were two boroughs. One of them was founded by the Viking armies, which carved up this part of Mercia in Alfred the Great's time, and it stood just over there on that terrace above the Welland, and the other was planted by Athelstan's father, Edward, uh, and deliberately planted and settled with English settlers at this end of the bridge. So you had a sort of divided town like Arab and Jewish Jerusalem with this fortified bridgehead uh, keeping the two of them apart. But according to later sources, it was Athelstan who first gave the Danes freedom of access to go and to buy and sell in English areas. And from his time onwards, uh, towns like this really boomed economically. And I suspect part of the reason, if you'd have asked a Danish trader of the time what he thought about it, would have been that he was allowed to keep his own social organization, his own law, and his own language. And that was why he could look upon Athelstan as a natural lord. Lincoln, one of the richest towns in Anglo-Saxon England. Here, excavations have shown that the city's great medieval mercantile wealth, still evident in these 12th century merchant houses, rested on the prosperous Anglo-Danish period. And now monuments to the taste of that first Lincoln middle class have come to light. These elaborate tomb covers commissioned by local men of substance. Such men wanted to see themselves as a part of Athelstan's sophisticated southern culture. But York was different. Over the Humber, they had always thought of themselves as separate. The king's law did not apply here. 
Here he had to ingratiate himself with the intelligentsia and the politicians by his generosity. To see the evidence for this today, we must travel much farther north, through 10th century Northumbria, through a land very different in custom, speech, and political tradition. To Saint Cuthbert, above all other northern saints, Athelstan gave a fantastic wealth of gifts to sustain declining northern Christianity. Here at Durham, the search for Athelstan becomes tangible, for of the many beautiful books, embroideries and artefacts he gave to the saint, astonishingly several survive today. They are among the great hereditary treasures of the English people, part of our collective memory. First, you must go through the Norman cloister to an unmarked door. Behind the medieval oak, you pass through modern steel as if to a bank vault. And indeed, in monetary terms, what lies inside is more valuable than gold. This marvellous book was probably written at Lindisfarne, one of the great centres of Northumbrian Christianity in the early 8th century. And it's been at the Church of St. Cuthbert since at least the 10th century. And on folio 31 verso, there is a poem about Athelstan and his conquest of Britain. Carta dirige gressus. Send your message across land and sea to the royal palace. First of all, send greetings to the Queen Mother, to the Prince, to the distinguished earls, the heavily armed thanes, who he now rules in this united England, is the perfecta Saxonia. King Athelstan now lives glorious through his deeds. In fact, this is a rather garbled version. It was written by a cleric who wasn't very good at Latin, but we can piece it together from better versions because this, in fact, is an adaptation of a poem originally sent to Charlemagne himself. Now, why is it in this book? Well, among Athelstan's gifts to St. Cuthbert were two gospel books, one of which uh, survives in fragments in the British Library. And it is possible that this treasure is the other one. And it may indeed have been the famous ancient gospel book which, until the Reformation, was kept on the high altar at Durham and which had a beautiful, ornate ivory cover with a silver gilt crucifixion, a fitting gift from the new Charlemagne. Other items in Athelstan's list of gifts included figured textiles and Byzantine silks, and today these fragments of Dark Age Eastern cloth, almost illegible with age, can still be seen in Durham. There is one last portion of Athelstan's treasure which is still preserved here in Durham, and it includes some of the most remarkable survivals of the Anglo-Saxon period. They are embroideries. They are a bishop's stole, a maniple, and a girdle and other pieces woven in gold threads with silken threads on a silk base. And they're so fragile that they can't now be moved. So their last restoration in 1936 will have been their last, and we may be among the last generations to see them in this state. And that's why I'm using a torch, because to shine full television lights on these pieces would be nothing short of an act of vandalism. They were made for Bishop Frithulstan of Winchester in about 930 by an Anglo-Saxon woman called Alfleet, probably not the Queen Mother, Athelstan's stepmother, but one of his known noble lady friends who practiced the English art of embroidery, of which these pieces are the earliest and among the greatest examples. They were discovered in 1827 in this coffin. This is the 7th century oak coffin of St. Cuthbert himself. And the fact that the embroideries were found inside it reveals one of the most characteristic aspects of medieval piety. It seems that the day that King Athelstan came to St. Cuthbert's shrine, what happened was this. 
The brethren of St. Cuthbert lifted the lid of the coffin, and with their help the king then wrapped the holy body in those eastern silks which are still preserved today in a fragmentary condition. He then laid the embroideries inside, uh, possibly even combed the hair of the holy body with the ivory comb which was also found in the coffin. He may have taken a relic for himself to put in the, the relic pouch that kings wore around their necks, and he left a personal written testament by the head of the saint. He then remained alone with the saint to pray, perhaps even spending the night by the tomb to procure a vision. You can still see people doing that today in the orthodox Christian lands of the Mediterranean. Because to a dark age man, saints were practical mediators between the divine and the earthly. And they gave practical help to a pious king like Athelstan in his wars against the pagans. And so to a 10th century man, any artifact associated with a man as charismatic as Cuthbert crackled with spiritual radioactivity. And so, when King Athelstan held this, as he must have done, the pectoral cross of St. Cuthbert himself, he was taking on, as he would have said, dunamis on eorthan, power on earth. Like all empires, Athelstan's could only exist by aggression. In 934, the Scots and North British made a bid for independence, and Athelstan immediately led a great fleet and army north to punish them for their presumption. With him, according to a charter which lists his leaders, were four Welsh kings who had sworn to be Athelstan's co-workers by land and sea. Here too were Mercians and Cornishmen, Viking earls from East Anglia and Yorkshire. In June, this imperial army moved through Northumbria, soliciting the aid of the Northern Saints. They passed Bamburgh, whose earls were marching in the host of their overlord. The expedition then advanced up the east coast by land and sea farther than any English army had ever penetrated. Athelstan called a halt at the Pictish rock fortress of Donotta on the coast south of Aberdeen. Faced by this massive display of force, the Scottish kings capitulated, and in a typical gesture, Athelstan reinstated them, sending his fleet on to devastate the northernmost shores of Britain. And so, Athelstan's peace his own particular brand of Pax Britannica was restored. By now, it must have been clear that if the Celts were going to have any chance of defeating him, they would have to join forces throughout the British Isles. Back in the south, the ruling class who'd achieved these victories could sit back. They were amply rewarded. After 50 years of high taxation, some even received land free of any burden. One such was the king's armour-bearer, Athelgard. He received an estate at Meon in Hampshire. Today, a typical English village, with its church, its green and its stream, 
Neon's underlying shape has not changed since 9.35. You can still trace the bounds of Athelgard's estate today, as you can with dozens of these Anglo-Saxon charters of the 10th century, which give really detailed descriptions of the lie of the land. Anyone can do it. All you need is a, a map, uh, a photocopy of the charter, and a bit of perseverance. And if you do do it, you'll uncover all those secret nooks and crannies of the English landscape, which we just passed by today, but with which the Anglo-Saxon was so familiar. The nut tree copse, the rush mere, Titch's farmstead. Now, the charter begins, Erstof Merch Beorga West Weirdum, which means that the bounds start off with a boundary tumulus, and this looks like it. It's a great big dugout Iron Age burial tumulus. These ancient barrows had special associations for Anglo-Saxons. They put them in touch with a mysterious, exotic pagan past, a race of giants and that was why they often chose them to be the boundary points for their estates. Now, the next stage of the boundary, says the charter, runs along the Hera Path northwards. And this must be it, although there isn't much of it. The Hera Path was the, the army path the path used by the local levies in time of war. And in fact, this one connects the hill fort, which lies on the hills above us, and the Mion Valley. The peasants at that time would have had to keep it open and clear for the passage of small armies. But uh, as you can see, nobody uses it now, so there's not much of it left. And running alongside us, the great boundary ditch of the estate. In fact, in fact, that's so big, I wonder whether it could be the boundary ditch of a Roman estate. You see, it's not impossible that Athelgard's estate lies on a much more ancient unit of organization. Could well be. The Hera path peters out at this point, and the charter doesn't mention a track, so the A32 can't have been very much in Anglo-Saxon times. The next point in the bounds is the river Meon itself. And that's it there. It's not much, a little trickle, but there's a little sheep bridge there that's probably been there for centuries. And from there, says the charter, you go Anlang Hedgeru, up the hedgerow. And it's as clear as day. That's a, a really enormous hedge that must be at least as old as Anglo-Saxon times. From here, the boundary points really come thick and fast. Follow the hedgerow right up the hill, and you go past the site of the Roman villa, which was maybe the centre of the estate in Roman times. And then, right on up to the top of the hill, you come to two quarries. They're named in the charter, and they're still to be seen on the ground. The boundary then starts to turn northwards to the farm by the oak trees. And there's still a farm there, and it crosses the Dean, of Bram Dean, and then we follow it all the way round eastwards, past Titch's farmstead, I wonder who he was, and crosses the Alton Road and comes to Rushmere. And Rushmere is still there. It's still a secluded little pond fed by an intermittent stream which runs down the road just as it did in Anglo-Saxon times. That's exactly what it says in the charter. And so the lady who owns it has told me today, it still does. From the Rush Pond, the boundary goes directly south, past fern breaks and then past ploughlands and a quagmire down to the Meon River itself at Westbury House. And then instead of following the modern boundary, it goes up the river and then turns up this tiny little stream, which was called Seolsborn in Anglo-Saxon. I've just asked the farmer whether it has a name today, and he says it doesn't. And the boundary goes up the stream, past its spring, and then right up onto the top of Teagley's Down. This is the southern boundary of the estate. The charter says that you've got to go along the made-up road, which is actually part of an ancient ridgeway, until you come to a cluster of barrows called Hema's Barrows. And this is obviously one of them. You'd miss it if you were just driving past. But this is an Iron Age burial tumulus, and the Anglo-Saxon surveyors who made up the bounds of this estate used it as one of their marker points. And from this place onwards, right the way to our starting point, you can follow the boundaries with the most astonishing clarity. This is the old Herapath, the army path. 
The charter says that when the boundary leaves the point where the roads divide, back up there, it goes through a small wood, which is easy enough to see, and then over Fernley and straight on down, keeping to that side of the track, down to the curved hollow. Thona, on West Halfa Weas, on Yeraita to Kyrdan Hila. And that's exactly what this is. An Anglo-Saxon from the 10th century could recognize this as easily as I can. And this is the first time that I've walked this. That's Athelgard's boundary, that great hedge running along the skyline. Now, that little dotted line is the hedgerow. It's still the parish boundary. And when it goes into the curved hollow, it arrives at a place called, in the 10th century, Toller's Dean. Now, Toller's Dean is probably the little valley in which the railway was built in 1903. The railway's disused now and is once more becoming a wooded valley overgrown with bushes and is used as a bridle path for riders. From the railway, the boundary goes directly north, through a little wood and back to the tumulus where we first started. So estates like Mion were the rewards of the Anglo-Saxon ruling class in the 30s, in the heyday of Athelstan's empire. And it's not difficult to imagine Athelgard standing here, surveying his domain in the heart of the West Saxon countryside with his horses and his hunting dogs and his hawks, thinking that war must have been a million miles away. But now the British Isles were in ferment. Now resistance to Athelstan was on everyone's lips. Rumour spread by land and sea. It was said that a great expedition was preparing in Irish ports, the greatest anyone had ever seen. From Ireland, from Wales, Cornwall, Scotland, Cumbria, the Western Isles, and farther afield, men were recruiting. We will pay them back for the last 400 years, wrote a Welsh poet. The Cymru will rise again. The English king will be humiliated for his pride, a schoolboy wrote in his exercise book. The stewards of the great king will flee through the forest crying woe. They will wallow in their own blood. In 937, the blow fell. A huge racial coalition of Celts and Scandinavians invaded Northumbria to drive the English out once and for all. Their landfall was in the Humber. If you'd have been standing here in September 937, you would have seen the greatest Viking fleet ever assembled out there. 615 ships. And what a sight that must have been. This is Spurn Point on the very end of the Humber estuary. Over in that direction is Lincolnshire and southern England. And here we're in Northumbria. At first sight it may seem strange that an invasion force drawn partly from Ireland should have come this route on the east coast. But in fact all the great expeditions into Northumbria in this period came by the Humber. The reason was simple. Here in Yorkshire, in Northumbria, an Anglo-Scandinavian society had developed which preferred a king in York, whether Viking or not, to a king in London or in Winchester. And in autumn of 937, we know now that the Northumbrians gave willing submission to the invaders and agreed to cooperate with them in the great adventure. And so, in the autumn of that year, the invaders moved south and started to devastate the lands to the south of the Humber, which were favorable to Athelstan. The question now was, this late in the year, what would Athelstan himself do? The king who struck terror with his name alone the king who, it was said, was a thunderbolt to his enemies. The king who, it was thought, was invincible. Late in the year, the outnumbered Athelstan attacked with Mercians and West Saxons. The weather was bad, terrific winds. The culminating battle was looked back on by later generations simply as the Great War. It took place at a fort called Brunanburg. But no one knows now where Brunanburg was. Our evidence suggests the climax of the war was in the border zone between the northerners and the southern English, in the Don Valley.
landscape that we're flying into is one of the most industrial landscapes in the whole of Britain, with the uh, Doncaster railheads, the South Yorkshire coalfield, and the great steelworks around Sheffield. But it is also one of our most historic landscapes, because in this narrow zone, in between the Humber tributaries and the Pennines, many of the great battles of Anglo-Saxon history were fought. In the 10th century, Northumbria was a kind of Dark Age Vietnam, and this was the demilitarized zone, with a, a band of forts on either side of the Don Valley, and we're flying into it now. The first of those forts, and probably the biggest, was Doncaster. It was a Roman site, and its history as a borough goes back into the early Anglo-Saxon period. But in Athelstan's time, it seems to have been re-fortified, with massive double ditches outside the Roman circuit. So it was a sort of fortified border post on the northern frontier of the Mercians, with a rectilinear street plan centering on the Church of St. George, which is right down there now. When you go further up the River Don, along the Northumbrian frontier, the next of the bulls that you come to is Conisburg. In the 10th century, this place was known as Atkanugasburg, the King's Bull, which was a Scandinavian name. But at that time, it probably belonged to the Anglo-Saxon kings of the south. And it was probably just a fort, not like Doncaster, a town. And it probably stood like today's castle on that mound below us with its magnificent Norman keep. North of the Don, on the line of the traditional fortified frontier of the Northumbrians, there was a whole line of forts all bearing Viking names, like Sprotborough and Barnborough. And one of them, Mexborough, or Mewksborough, uh, still has an earthwork to show. And it's right down there below us. It's now the public park in the middle of Mexborough. At Rotherham, the Don and the Rother diverge. And it's here that we get into the real military hotspot of the 10th century. Now we're flying into the zone which is critical for understanding what went on in the campaign of Brunambor. At least, I think so. We're just crossing over the River Rother, south of its confluence with the Don. So we're just into Mercia. At this point, the great Roman road south from York down towards Derby crosses over a hill called the White Hill, where the River Rother makes a great turn round it. And in fact, the modern planners have also built the M1 across that hill. It's one of the, the great Dark Age routes into the south of England. On the top of that hill, in Anglo-Saxon times, stood a settlement called Brunersford. In other words, the same personal name as Brunanburg. And I think that the famous lost fortress of Brunambur stood on that hill in this no man's land in between the Northumbrian frontier and the northern border of the Mercians. So, to my mind, the battlefield of Brunambur lies just to the side of the M1 here between Sheffield and Rotherham. And we're going to land on it now. Although we can't be certain, there's a good chance that the great battle which a later generation of Anglo-Saxons simply call the Great War took place in these fields by the M1. There is one little point which might clinch it. There is a Norse saga on this battle, and it says that the lie of the land was that a river fell away on one side and that there was a great forest on the other. And that is exactly the configuration of the ground here, because there on the horizon is Tinsley Forest, an Anglo-Saxon forest mentioned in the Doomsday Book, which still preserves part of its forest ditch. 
And so we can imagine in this spot, Athel stands heavily armed thanes, men like Athelgaard of Mion, having sworn their oaths of mutual help and having prayed, making their great attack as dawn rose here around Brunanbu. Joshua, Athelstan conquered the hostile kings and crushed their proud necks. Here wrote an English poet, glorying in the slaughter, the black raven and the brown eagle with the white tail shared their feast with the wolf, the grey beast of the forest. Never before was there such a slaughter since the time when the English first invaded Britain from across the wide seas, warriors eager for fame overcame the Welsh and won themselves a kingdom. died a bachelor in 939, 40 years but for a night after Alfred the Great. The mentality of most of these Dark Age warlords inevitably escapes us, but in his books, preserved in the British Library, Athelstan has left us a tiny gleam of illumination into his thought world. This is the book on which he swore his coronation oath. It carries a note about his freeing of a slave and his family. A present from Otto of Germany, with a poem about Athelstan full of proud boasts. Holy Athelstan, famous through the wide world, set up by God, strong in war. Burned fragments from a book given by the pious king to St. Cuthbert. I give this book to St. Cuthbert forever. May no one ever remove it. This later copy of a law code reveals the king's humanity. The king feels it too cruel that so many people as young as 12 years are executed for such small offences as he sees is the case everywhere. It seems to him that no one under 15 should be killed by the law. Inscriptions in three books carry the king's own plea to later generations. Whoever reads this in the future let him offer a prayer to the Almighty for my sake. Pray for my sins. Finally, the king's own Psalter, a pocket-sized personal book of worship which he carried around with him, with its added pictures, a Greek litany, a royal calendar. No one more just or learned, it was said in England, ever administered our public affairs. The English landscape has been made by all the immigrant peoples who have come here over 5,000 years. But in a social and political sense, the Anglo-Saxons were the chief makers of England. And among them, Athelstan perhaps deserves a place of honour among his great kinsmen.
presenting the works of